Uh, thank you, Dr. Howard. Uh, my name is Stephen Markowitz. I'm an occupational medicine physician, epidemiologist, and I direct the Commoner, Barry Commoner Center at the City University of New York. I want to thank Dr. Howard for that excellent overview. Also, uh, he has provided just such extraordinary leadership of the World Trade Center program, really since the beginning, uh, as administrator since 2010, 2011 under Zadroga, but even prior to that, since, since soon after 2001, uh, when people needed medical care. Uh, we, today we have an excellent panel of 12 speakers. Uh, we have a limited amount of time, so uh, each of them is going to have uh, relatively a few minutes to give highlights of their uh, uh, view of what's happening, both in terms of the World Trade Center Health Program. We have the medical directors from all the clinical centers of excellence. We have two program participants, uh, WTC Health Program participants, who will share their experiences. And we also have a message, an additional message from NIOSH. So uh, at the end, we will take questions and answers, or we will deal with questions and answers. For those of you online, you, uh, if you look in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see there's a place where you can submit a question. And if you submit that question, we'll sort through them and address questions towards the end of the, um, end of the session. So let me introduce our first speaker, who is Commander Brittany Rizek. She's Deputy Division Director of the World Trade Center Health Program at National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. Uh, welcome, Ms. Rizek, who is online. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, well, good morning, and thank you so much for having me today. Um, I am the de Deputy Director for the World Trade Center Health Program. And as Dr. Howard discussed, um, he talks a little bit about the history of the program and how the screening program started and how that screening generated better understanding of the health conditions, which led to offering annual monitoring and a need to continually treat the health conditions that were a result of the 9-11 exposure. Later today, you're gonna to hear from my colleagues about specific health conditions. And today I'll briefly touch on the changing of our member population, that changing health, and where we are going based on trends in the research, as well as lessons learned for the future environmental disasters. The majority of our 112,000 members will be over the age of 65 within the next 10 years. And this intersection of debilitating World Trade Center related health conditions along with age related diseases will be truly realized in the upcoming decades. Aging is the primary risk for some of these common conditions such as hearing loss, osteoarthritis, back and neck pain, heart disease, cancers, and cognitive decline to name a few. Although the program does not certify most of these conditions, we do anticipate these diseases and chronic disabilities will impact the quality of life of our members. For instance, due to natural aging, we anticipate age-related hearing loss will be prominent in our population within the next 10 years. And if you cannot hear well, we can't expect our member to understand and internalize the information given by a provider to manage their World Trade Center-related disease, and that impacts their quality of life. The challenge will be to find innovative ways to help members coordinate their care and find the resources they need to manage their hearing loss or an age-related ailment to, to really be able to optimize their World Trade Center disease. And in general, complications of natural aging complicate the health conditions we already cover, and it's going to be a serious component of the program moving forward. The program continues to find ways to optimize care through research. The mission of the World Trade Center Health Program Research Component is to investigate health impacts and disabilities arising from the 9-11 attacks and to optimize that care for our membership. So as the membership ages and we learn more from research, we may see a shift in the research focus. But for now, our researchers are seeking to find increased effective approaches for medical monitoring and understanding the long-term clinical effects to improve the healthcare and well-being of our at-risk populations. In 2020, the program conducted a comprehensive review of findings from the first decade of research, looking at 944 research articles published between 9-11-2001 in the spring of 2020. And they did this with the goal of identifying trends, vulnerable populations, and giving us future direction for our continued research. At that time of the review, 291 publications were funded by the program. 
The subjects of the studies were either responders, survivors, or both responder and survivor populations. And the publications on those two categories are nearly equal. As of today, a year since that review was done, we have more than 1,000 publications and approximately 345 were funded by the program. So what did that first decade of research find? The program found that through March of 2020, aerodigestive disorders comprised of the largest clinical monitoring and treatment category, accounting for 56% of our members' conditions. The research also suggests a significant and persistent increased risk of PTSD in our affected population, and that there's a modestly increased risk in the World Trade Center population for all cancers combined. Based on these key findings, the future direction may consist of fo focusing our research on healthcare inequalities to improve the healthcare of our at-risk populations, further investigating signals that were identified within the population who were experiencing hypertensive disorders and mild cognitive impairment, and also continuing disaster research, identifying prevention and mitigation strategies to reduce adverse health effects in the populations affected in future disasters. And we'll talk about some lesson learned, lessons learned here in a moment. So in terms of lessons learned, how do we improve the health and safety of our responders and the community members in future disasters? To do this, we need to be able to track who was there, when they were there, and the proximity they were to the exposures. We must roster the responders and the response activities. And this has been successfully implemented in recent disasters. We also need to know who in the population is affected, how they are affected, so that we can provide resources to help protect them, um, to provide them food, utilities, and also mental health resources. Responders should also be monitored during the response and the assessments conducted during and of course after those response activities. By monitoring exposure and using hazard mapping, we can increase protective equipment when necessary and make continued informed decisions during response activity. Another lesson learned and topic for consideration is the unique toxic exposures and specifically at the towers. We can acknowledge that some disasters have individual carcinogens, but a mixture of five carcinogens might act very differently from one in itself. Some other operational and strategic lessons learned are to unify the safety management structure under one command, even if we're at state, local, and federal levels in response activity. Providing that unified safety and health guidance from a centralized expert peer review is imper imperative. Understanding these lessons, we can improve the documentation, why decisions were made, what gaps were in those decisions, what we didn't know, um, and collaboration and lessons learned will improve those outcomes and keep our responders and community members safe in future unforeseen environmental disasters. One area that's continued, that has a continued needs not yet implemented nationally is a separate telecommunication band for emergency responders to communicate with our other emergency responders on an exclusive and restricted line uh, when the population overwhelms cell phone towers and cities infrastructure during disasters. So where are we? Are things getting better? Yes, um, we have strengthened the federal, state, and local partnerships tremendously. We now hold regularly, regularly scheduled drills, multi-agency national exercises. There has been a certification established for use of chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear full face piece respiratory protective devices. They're called CBRN for short. And we have much better means of communicating in real time with the public, the media, and the responder community through secure platforms as well as social media. NIOSH has specifically established a special office for the emergency preparedness and response with extensive experience in field response and the power to reach across the entire institute to find expertise for all types of exposures. And this was most recently used for Deepwater Horizon, mining disasters, hurricanes, and most recently COVID. We have also improved our ability for environmental sampling strategies for both biological and chemical exposures. So yes, we have improved. The World Trade Center Health Program will continue to enrich our approach to care for the affected population. We continually assess health equity to inform that care, and we will continue to share lessons learned for enhanced response activities for disasters post 9-11. Again, I thank you for your time today, and I look forward to hearing from the rest of you. It's always an honor to be your colleague and to serve our members. Ms. Rizek, uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, just turning off your the video and audio feed, but stay with the program because uh, we're going to have some questions in an hour and a half or so. 
uh, some of which may be uh, directed towards you. So uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Crane. Uh, he's professor of environmental medicine and public health here at the Icon School of Medicine. And uh, he is also director of the World Trade Center uh, Clinical Center of, uh, for, of Excellence for, uh, for Mount Sinai. So welcome, Dr. Crane. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm going to be looking at the slides over here, uh, so I'm not turning away from anyone at the camera. So colleagues, welcome. Great to have you with us. Um, responders, survivors, we are honored by uh, your allowing us to participate in your care. So what I'm going to do uh, today, if I can get the clicker, is, uh, oh, here it comes. These are minor technical difficulties, which will be corrected. <laughs> There we go. So I'm going to talk about World Trade Center comorbidity. A comorbidity just means that is a situation where a person has more than one World Trade Center related condition. I'm going to talk about the impact uh, briefly on healthcare payments. I'm going to talk about its um, impact, presumed impact uh, on aging, uh, just to follow up uh, Commander Isaac's comments, and a little bit about prevention. So uh, what you're going to hear is that many responders develop multiple World Trade Center related conditions, that they are comorbid. Uh, that comorbid increases healthcare payments uh, under World Trade uh, disproportionately. It's associated with a condition called world, <laughs> called age-related frailty, um, and that's an association, not true established cause and effect, but something very important for us to investigate given the age structure of our population. And frailty has a, is a syndrome which is very disabling and is notable for extremely high health care costs. Um, the good news is it may be preventable, and we are going to talk a little bit about how my, we might be able to <coughs> excuse me, participate in that. So you heard from Dr. Charney and Brittany already about the exposure. Uh, it was a very variegated exposure, lots of toxins, very, very, varying in intensity from the pile out to uh, the external parts of the exposure zone. Um, and the varied nature of the World Trade Center exposure likely contributed to a variety of exposures and therefore a variety of symptoms. And again, comorbidity, more than one illness. Uh, this clicker is slow. Um, so there are many frequently observed comorbidities among World Trade Center responders. And if, I don't know if you can see this chart, but if you look at the bottom where it says three plus on the left and then over to two columns over, you will see that about 35% of World Trade Center responders have three or more World Trade Center conditions. Uh, look at the number two and look to the right, 11% of World Trade Center responders have two conditions. So comorbidity, more than one condition, is very, very common among World Trade Center responders. And what does it do? Well, study after study externally has showed that expenses for the treatment of an individual with comorbid conditions may be super additive. And what that means is the payments for the comorbid patient's treatment exceed the sum of payments for treating those same conditions in different individuals without comorbidity. So in other words, it's sort of like one plus one doesn't equal two when it's in one person. It leaks more than three or four. So, um, I asked our data center to see if they could find examples of this, and they did a wonderful job in a data search and ran a model that has been, um, uh, sorry, I went too far, um, developed by our Dr. Blakely out in Melbourne. But if you look at this slide on the left-hand column, and you see the second line, asthma and GERD, and then you see to the right, 708. So what that says is, for a patient who has asthma plus GERD together, that patient's annual payments are $708 more than the sum of the payments for a patient who has only GERD plus the patient who has only asthma. Next line, asthma plus P PTSD. That patient's uh, treatment each year costs $672 more on average than the patient who has uh, the sum of, for the patient who has only PTSD and the sum of the patient who has only asthma. So, and there are many, 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 many other uh, comor comorbid combinations here. Um, and I don't know the reason for this, and the other researchers who've been looking at this really don't either, but you see the increased payments 
Um, and always when you see that, there may be opportunities for improving care coordination and resource utilization, but it's still a, a very important phenomenon. But the most important of all, um, just dovetailing over uh, back to uh, Commander Isaac's comments, is does it affect the aging of our population? So frailty is a, ki a condition characterized by a decline in functioning across many systems, increased vulnerability to stressors, hospitalizations, falls, and missions to long-term care. Think in your minds the image of a, a person described as a frail elderly person. You probably have someone bent over walking with a walker, concerned about falls and what have you, and it, unfortunately a fairly accurate image. Frailty is age-related, it is considered a extreme consequence of normal aging process and possibly preventable, but is it related to comorbidity? Are our World Trade Center responders who have more than one uh, healthcare condition more at risk for frailty? Well, we know about the increased cross, the falls, the fractures, these folks are usually quite miserable, particularly when they're in, in the ER, in the hospital. And here you see in a, a non-World Trade Center population what that structure looks like. So this is from Amsterdam. Um, you see, I don't know if you can see it or not, but the left-hand side is where the age, uh, age of beginning, and then it goes on, and you can see the increase in um, the percentage of folks with frailty as you get out into the 80s. It's a pretty steep climb there. And the reason I put this one up, uh, responders, is because that number 57 there, right at the lower left-hand corner, just happens to be extremely close, if not the average age of World Trade Center responders. So folks, we are on that graph. We're on it now. And what we want to do with you through monitoring through World Trade is flatten that curve out and make sure we don't have those high percentages uh, going forward for our responders. So how do we do it? Well, there's two major models of frailty. Uh, the one we use is the syndrome here with our Department of Geriatrics. Um, the syndrome model has five criteria for frailty, low hand grip strength, slow gait speed, low physical activity, self-reported exhaustion, and unintentional weight loss of greater than 5% in a year. You have three or more of those in those age groups, and you're considered to be frail or at risk for frailty. So what about comorbidity? If you have more than one World Trade Center condition, or more than two World Trade Center conditions, are you at risk for frailty? Well, big study by Dr. Vitrano et al. Uh, could not come to a causal conclusion because so many of the studies done were cross-sectional. However, the one really excellent longitudinal cohort, which comes out of Beijing, demonstrated a markedly increased one-year incidence of frailty for patients with two or greater than two chronic conditions, greater than two. Now, you've already seen how many World Trade Center responders from that prior graph have three or more conditions. We have to take this seriously. Going back to uh, Commander Rizek's comments, we have to take it seriously because our patients may be at risk of this condition, and it is a miserable condition. So we think that ongoing World Trade Center monitoring, participation in the program, can both detect and prevent and possibly reverse frailty. Um, and NIOSH has very graciously funded a frailty research project here at Mount Sinai for, at, the, at the monitoring program. Uh, it's going to be a multidisciplinary sort of study with interventions, including assessment of diet and physical activity and social activity and lifestyle issues. Um, this is the blurb for it. Uh, it's, uh, it's right down at the bottom. You can see uh, you just can email, email Amy Park. You can come to the monitoring program and just say, I want to sign up, or you can call that number. And I urge you, I urge you responders, if you are in your 50s, to participate in this, in this research project. You will be helping yourself a lot, and you will be helping a heck of a lot of other responders uh, right now. And you will be doing what you always have been doing, which is stepping forward and helping others. Uh, so this is, this is right for right now. Um, so in summary, comorbid conditions increase healthcare expansion. <laughs> Excuse me. They may be, comorbidity may be associated with increased frailty, and we're going to be looking at that. And we think that the World Trade Center Health Program, through monitoring and con treatment, can continue to contribute to the understanding and prevention of both these things. Um, and finally, responders. You don't need another comorbidity, okay? And COVID and long COVID are miserable comorbidities. You don't need them. So please, please, if you have not gotten vaccinated against COVID, get vaccinated. Get vaccinated and protect yourself.
So with that, I want to just thank everybody, uh, and especially the crew from the data center who put together the data. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, our next speaker is our colleague from Stony Brook, Dr. Benjamin Loft. He's the uh, Edward Pellegrino Professor at the Stony Brook School of Medicine and also the director of the World Trade Center, Clinical Center of Excellence at Stony Brook. So welcome, Dr. Luft. Yeah, sure. uh, thank you, Steve. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, something that uh, is not um, a certified condition. Uh, but it really fits in very well with uh, some of the other comments that were made by uh, uh, Mike and uh, uh, Dean Charney. Uh, and that's the uh, increasing problem associated with uh, cognitive impairment and dementia in the World Trade Center responder community. So these this studies uh, were funded uh, by NIOSH uh, as part of their research program as well as the National Institute of uh, Aging and by the Research Foundation uh, at Stony Brook. So I want to kind of talk a little bit about, first of all, to kind of get some definitions uh, as to uh, what different words mean or what different phrases mean. Uh, when we talk about mild cognitive impairment, uh, it's a stage of aging that occurs as a result of cognitive decline that is more serious than is usually seen in normal aging. So it's abnormal uh, and uh, pathologic. Having MCI decreases life expectancy by approximately 5.2 years on average. At age 55, approximately 4 to 5% of individual, individuals would be expected to have MCI. On average, 10.2% of patients with MCI will progress to dementia within one year. Now, I want to put a little bit of a, a proviso there. Uh, this is in patients who develop idiopathic MCI. Uh, when we talk about patients who are in the World Trade Center or who have been exposed to a variety of toxins, and have developed MCI as a result of that, we really don't know what the natural history is yet. But as you'll see from uh, the uh, discussion, uh, you'll see that it's, it's ominous. Dementia, on the other hand, is loss of memory, language, problem solving, and cognition that's, that are serious enough to inf interfere with normal life activities. So we began studying this about seven to eight years ago uh, when we received a, a grant from the National Institute of Aging, and that was then supplemented by a grant from NIOSH. And the first set of studies that we did, now this is in 2016 now, uh, and now we have data from four years later uh, because we've been studying these patients prospectively uh, since that time. 14% of responders, of 818 responders, were cognitively impaired as defined by a validated clinical exam, the MOCA, which I think we've all heard about in the news. And cognitive impairment was associated with the presence of PTSD and depression. About 15% of another group of responders whose average age was only 54 were categorized as cognitively impaired using a different exam called the Cox state. And this was on tasks of memory, processing speeds, and were associated with PTSD severity and working on site for greater than five weeks. So we began to get some information that this was not only related to the psychiatric problems that patients were having, but exposures. Across a one to 2.5 year period of time, when we prospectively began studying our cohort of eight, uh, sub cohort of 1,800 patients, 14.2% who were cognitively unimpaired at baseline 
developed cognitive impairment within the course of two years. Again, this is something that is not seen normally, especially when you're dealing with patients who are only 55 years of age. And, uh, and again, PTSD symptom severity and longer exposure to the World Trade Center site was associated with this, as was uh, having the APOE4, a genetic marker for dementia. We found that responders with cognitive impairment were more likely to also experience physical functional changes and impairment indicating reductions in quality of life. And uh, at the same time that we began to assess the cognitive functioning of our patients, we did a standard uh, performance battery uh, on all of our patients uh, to assess their functional activity. And what we saw was that these patients who were developing cognitive impairment were also developing physical impairments as well. And I think this speaks to Mike's point that our patients, that these were markers for perhaps increasing frailty. We, interest, we recently undertook a novel effort to figure out the neuropsychological profile of responders with neurodegeneration and found that memory was a central feature, but so was the ability for cognition and slower response speeds. So this is a very, this is, uh, was really the first time that we began to use objective testing and began to see some very uh, significant findings in terms of cognition and aging. Well, to be very honest, I was stunned by this. Actually, I, I didn't believe it. Uh, you know, these were people who I knew. They were 55 years old by on uh, average. Uh, I, I've been with them for a long time since, since shortly after 9-11. Uh, and I didn't really want to, to, to believe it. Uh, and so we began to do a variety of neurologic, neuroradiographic exams, molecular imaging, neuroimaging, um, as well as uh, biologic testing of their blood to see if there was any markers that were associated with changes in the brain. So we undertook a study that was done uh, in collaboration with, uh, with Mount Sinai, uh, where we examined 99 responders who, were, who were either had significant cognitive impairment and patients who did not have significant cognitive impairment and with and without PTSD. Now the patients who were cognitively impaired had reduced gray matter volume. Now the gray matter is the part of the brain that is responsible for cognition. Uh, and so that was really a very important finding that the cognitive impairment was also associated with something, with changes in the brain, that there was changes indica indicative of neurodegeneration. The, uh, this was manifested by decreased cortical thickness, which is the area of the gray matter, and it was in 23 of 34 regions of the brain that were associated with dementias. We also noted that there was reduced hippocampal volume in four, uh, in four of eight hippocampal subfields, and reduced hippocampal volume was also associated with longer exposure at the World Trade Center site. And I think this is very important because this is another indicator that this was indeed World Trade Center related. Uh, predictions of cognitive impairment on uh, uh, using an Alzheimer's disease signature was moderate. It wasn't as strong, but our own signature was replicated both within the sample as well as patients outside of the sample. And so I think that this is a very important finding that what we're seeing here is not typical cognitive impairment, MCI, or typical dementias. These are things, what we're seeing here are the, the, what we're seeing in the brain is the pattern of abnormalities were unique. It was not typical of, uh, of these other well-known conditions, but they were overlapping. 
Pilot studies demonstrated, and this is what we call molecular imaging. We began to look at the brains uh, at our patients to see if they had any abnormalities within the brain. Uh, and what we were able to show was that there was deposition of amyloid and tau that may be highlighting similar changes that are somewhat unique to this population. And PTSD status did not predict cortical thickness or hippocampal volume outcomes. So there were two uh, other studies that were done at, uh, with other groups. Um, one was at the fire department, one was at the registry, and uh, they, they, they did not use a, uh, a systematic neuropsychological testing. Instead, they used a questionnaire. And uh, in short, uh, since my time is, <laughs> is almost up, what they found was that there, that there was an inordinate amount of cognitive dysfunction, or that patients were complaining of this, but that it was very closely related to the neuropsychiatric conditions. And so that, that is, but the important thing that I noted from all of that was that in two distinct populations, cognitive issues were present and demanded further study. So I'm going to put just both through. So what are the conclusions? Varying degrees of cognitive impairment are more prevalent in World Trade Center responders uh, than expected. The full extent of cognitive impairment in other populations, such as survivors and residents of Lower Manhattan, is unknown. But some theorized exposures may even be worse in these populations. We are not sure if this is a World Trade Center specific or another known disorder, but are working to determine this fact. Cognitive dysfunction is beginning to affect quality of life and will ultimately also impact families, relationships, retirement, and life expectancy. Further studies are being performed with the fire department. We have a, a grant that we received together to document the extent of MCI and dementia and concomitant neuroradiographic abnormalities in that population as well. So um, this is something that we all have to deal with now. Uh, it's something that's ominous, and I think it's very important for us to look at our total population of responders and survivors to see the uh, breadth of the problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben. Next speaker is uh, uh, who's a lifelong resident of Lower Manhattan and a participant. Uh, I think she's probably an electric speaker, I would guess, judging from the mic here. But <clears throat> she's co-chair of Manhattan Community Board One. And she's a member of the Scientific and Technical Advisory uh, Committee of NIOSH. And uh, she's going to talk uh, in her few minutes about experience as a member of the uh, World Trade Center Health Program from the survivor population. Welcome. Thank you. I just want to correct. I'm, I'm not the co-chair of, of Community Board One. I'm the co-chair of the Quality of Life Committee on Community Board One, and as well as their, their treasurer. Are you able to hear me? Um, I really just wanted to participate today to um, share how much the program is needed from the perspective of survivors, at least myself and my own family. Um, so I'll start by sharing how we were exposed. Um, my, my dad was actually on Park Rose, which is, runs parallel to, to Broadway um, at 9 o'clock in the morning on September 11th. My kids were at school in Soho. Uh, and I was at work in Long Island City. My mother was on Liberty Street, having um, just left Greenleaf um, Temporary Services, um, picking up her paycheck, through whom she worked at Deutsche Bank. So that's why she was on Liberty Street. Um, at, by the end of the day, my mother had somehow made it back to Harlem um, via buses and things. and. My dad had managed to pick up my kids from school and was um, at my house on Gold Street 
five blocks east and a block north of the trade center of the towers. And um, I reached there sometime that night, pretty much having walked uh, home from Long Island City, Queens. So we all went through the dust and then went to the dust because you know our apartment was filled with it. Um, again, when I live east, of course, the, the dust blew east and my windows were wide open. My terrace door was open. It was like 80 degrees that day. And so when we got home, there was just the thick dust all over the place. And um, as soon as I was able to see by daylight, because we had no power or anything, I began to, to clean it. And um, I don't recall us being able to get the messages that were going on in the news um, initially, just because we didn't have power. Um, and I, but I did everything I could to like remove, I just knew that the dust I, I couldn't live with it in my house. I didn't, you know. And so I did everything I could to get rid of basically all of the furniture. I prioritized my children, all of the furniture out of, the, out of their room. Um, although I was almost nine months pregnant, you know, I did what I could. And then I called maintenance to help me with what I couldn't do, including like getting on my hands and knees, you know, and like rip, literally ripping up their carpet, uh, rolling it up and having, having it picked up. So we were completely in it, um, enveloped in it. And then by the time I finally could see the news, you know, we were told that that was fine, that we should be cleaning, that the air was clean, we should even go outside. I didn't go outside um, because again, I was pregnant. And so um, although on voluntary uh, evacuation, I was told by my doctor to stay close. Um, to the hospital, which I live across the street from. So we were, we just stayed in the house as much as we could. My mother, who was told it was safe to return to work, would come and visit us and bring us food and check on us and make sure we were okay. Um, Cause she had, she was back at Deutsche Bank every day. Um, so fast forward, my mother's now a stage four colon cancer survivor. She's at, um, she had gone into a home February, 2020 for temporary long-term care right before the pandemic and sort of got stuck there, but thankfully was able to still get her monitoring visit from the program and everything over the phone um, with a, like a conference call. I lost my dad in May of, um, well, his death certificate says the COPD that he got from 9-11 and high blood pressure. All three of my kids, including the one that was in utero, are sick, they, got, they were sick right away. And my pediatrician, the one who literally took them from my GYN, you know, was in, was in the room with me when I had them, didn't believe in 9-11 related illness. Um, at the time that I was saying, I felt my kids were dealing with it. And so I, you know, dragged them around from doctor to doctor um, from, from the time my youngest, who will be 20 um, in October, was only like 10 months old. I was already taking them to the ENT and um, they were put on all kinds of medicine, like, you know, baby Singulair and Advair and Albuterol. And they each had like five medications and that gets expensive. I had to take them to the doctor like every month and I was on private insurance. So it was like $50 per child, per copay, per month, per medication, per doctor visit, per everything. When the ENT wasn't enough, started going to a pulmonary specialist, pediatric pulmonary specialist, again, prioritizing my children. I wasn't even like looking into myself. Um, although at one point I was walking around with five bleeding ulcers, duodenitis, gastritis, um, all this, because I have severe uh, GI problems. Uh, um, my, my baby also has the severe GI problems, although she wasn't, again, wasn't here. By the time she was four, she was having endoscopy at the children's hospital. Um, my, uh, she also has like, you know, the respiratory issues. My older two have the respiratory issues. My son has a really bad case of sleep apnea. My two older children, um, have PTSD. My daughter actually has her last visit with her, with her doctor today. He's leaving, but, um, it's been amazing. The doctor's there and she's looking forward to getting a new one. My younger daughter is trying, is on the waiting list to, you know, get some treatment as well, although she wasn't born yet. You know, she was 
from the time she's a baby. She's been dragged around to, to doctors and she grew up in a household with everybody else had 9-11 related illness and PTSD, so I guess she got it too. Um, I, um, myself, like I said, I have the, I have the GI issues. I have the, I have the um, upper and lower respiratory issues. I used to get pneumonia every year. I've had pneumonia about five times to the extent that I would go to the doctor and tell him I had pneumonia. And, um, you know, it's, it's just really, it was a blessing to have met people like Dr. Rodman, even Dr. Markowitz, I know him a long time too, um, which is not normal. I mean, I wouldn't normally meet <laughs> an epidemiologist, um, you know, I don't think in, in my life, but I have um, Terry Miles, that was the director of HHC at the time. These were the great people that I met that contrary to my children's pediatrician and my, maybe my own doctor, you know, believed what I was saying, agreed that it was possible, checked them out and then, you know, diagnosed it. So then they started seeing um, really wonderful pediatric doctor at the program, Elizabeth Fiorino, I'll never forget her. It's been 20 years, I still remember her name. Um, and, we, you know, we need this. We need this for the reasons that I said about the, the co-pays. You know, I, I, could, I probably would be homeless by now. I'm, I'm sure I would be. <laughs> if I if they weren't if the you know the government hadn't taken over the the payments for all of these treatments and um, I know I guess that's all I have to say we need the program thank you <laughs> uh, thank you Miss James and and, and I'm I'm sure it's not easy to tell your story and keep telling your story over and over again. But thank you. It, uh, obviously, people need to hear it and need to understand why this program is so important to people. So thank you. Uh, Dr. Reidman, Dr. Joan Reidman is a professor of medicine, environmental medicine at NYU Grossman School of Medicine at Bellevue and is the, medical, is the director of the, of the WTC uh, Center of Excellence for the Survivor Population and really has been the leader in taking care of and studying people in the community around uh, Ground Zero for at least a dozen years now. So welcome, Dr. Ryben. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to be in this program, and thank you, Marianne, for telling your story. Um, and I also want to thank Dr. Howard, uh, who we met actually more than 12 years ago, let's call it almost 20 now at this point, um, that I've been involved. Uh, who used to come and actually listen to all our, our patients when we were a self-funded and then a Red Cross-funded program. Uh, and he had enormous patience to, to listen to everybody, and we were very appreciative of that. Um, how do I go forward here? Oh, here. Okay. Um, I want to uh, start a little bit. I, I sort of am going to change this a little bit. I want to talk about uh, the World Trade Center as an environmental disaster in the local community. And I think what you've been hearing uh, uh, so far is, uh, is in, you know, the enormous uh, efforts and response we had of the responders and how heroic um, they have been and you have been all these years. I want to also talk a little bit about heroes that we don't usually think about, and those are actually the heroes in the community that we tend not to recognize. But if we think about it, and we think about all those who helped each other down the stairs of the World Trade Center towers as they were collapsing, we think about, for example, and I know these stories because these are stories that we have of all the patients who come into our program who have to give us a narrative and have to tell all their stories in excruciating detail. The stories of the teachers, for example, at PS 234, who waited, not knowing what was happening, but waited with their students uh, until the parents could come and pick them up. And when there were 70 left that no parents could uh, get, they ran with those students up to PS 11, not knowing what was going on, not knowing what was going to happen with them or with their students. Or the nursery school uh, teachers uh, who had the little pre-kid, little toddlers in nursery school, many of them for, for parents who were working near the World Trade Center who put their kids in supermarket carts and rolled them up uh, to keep them safe. 
or the residents who came back and lived in their apartments, cleaned their apartments because they were told that was the patriotic thing to do, and so they came back day after day or the workers who came one week later to streets that were filled with resuspended dust, to offices that were incompletely uh, clean, because this was the patriotic thing to do. And so what I want to say is that we have a whole group in the community of people who came back and said, this is what we need to do to keep New York safe, to keep America back on its feet. And I want to really recognize all those people and this is the group of people that we've been serving in the World Trade Center Environmental Health Center. So these patients had potential for acute exposures on 9-11 and chronic exposures from residual and resuspended dust and fumes from the fires. And together uh, with the community, with uh, our academic program, with NIOSH now, we have 20 years of joint community academic government work on medical surveillance and treatment for these community members who were named survivors under the Zadroga Act. And we called ourselves, eventually we started out as the Bellevue Asthma Clinic, we then moved into the Red Cross Health Impacts Program when we were funded by the Red Cross, and then the World Trade Center Environmental Health Center when we were first funded by the city. We called ourselves the Environmental Health Center because we wanted to certainly help this population, but we wanted to learn from this population what environmental injuries can do uh, and how we can prevent them for other environmental disasters. So we began uh, a program at Bellevue Hospital, and then we, uh, as we had increased funding, expanded to include Gouverneur and Elmhurst Hospital, Gouverneur because it's lower Manhattan, Elmhurst because it had a lot of the, uh, a lot of people lived in Queens, including many of the cleanup workers. And to date, we serve uh, at least 13,000 survivors. These include local workers, residents, students, and those who are passing by. This is a number that continues to increase. We are a treatment and surveillance program, and by that I mean that because under the law we are not surveying everybody, we are only allowed to uh, include patients who have World Trade Center related symptoms. So it's a self-referred community members with World Trade Center related physical illness or mental health illness, and it's not a general surveillance program, and that has huge implications for us as a program when we start thinking about how do we look at health effects. We were a program that was open to adults and children. So we had, uh, uh, we, I say had, we had a whole pediatric component. You heard about our pediatric pulmonologist. We had a developmental pediatrician uh, in our program. Most of those people are now young adults, so we are phasing out the pediatric program. And again, we, serve, uh, we, we treat mostly aerodigestive disorders, cancers, mental health symptoms. Importantly, and this is how we differ enormously from the responder program, our demographics are very different. And by definition, because we're a community program, we're about 50% women, uh, as you can see here. We have a very diverse race and ethnicity uh, in our program as well. So this has very important implications as we start thinking about how do we look at health effects in the responders? Do they mimic health effects in the survivors? How do we look at these as, as, as important groups? We also serve a wide age range. We were the only program offering care to children. Uh, and so as you heard, we have an age range from newly born to uh, over 75 on 9-11. And uh, we have about 1,000 who were college age. Uh, I don't know why I thought 25 was college age, but for some reason I did on or below 9-11 uh, in our direct program at the moment, although clearly we're open for more patients to come in. So what I want to focus on a little bit today, just very quickly, is what have we learned, and one of our interests has been certainly on cancers, and what have we learned about cancers in the civilian population? And really, we ourselves cannot really be a good epidemiologic program because we're self-referred, and so we have to rely on other uh, groups. And we look at that data from the Department of Health uh, and Mental Hygiene, World Trade Center Health Registry. And again, these data take time to, to, to develop, uh, and their last study suggested an excess incidence of cancers in survivors and responders as of 2011. So again, that's a long time ago. Clearly, we need to look more again. But 992 
cases uh, in that group at that point. With prostate and skin melanoma, we're increased in responders and civilians, and I think we'll see that over and over. But a significant excess of breast cancer among World Trade Center exposed women or female civilians not involved in rescue and recovery. So what have we learned about cancers in the World Trade Center EHC? Well, we, in order to look at this, we developed a pan-cancer database with detailed information about all cancers. We felt that it was important to understand are there commonalities across cancers as well as issues within individual cancers. And to date, we've looked at 2,500 patients with solid and blood cancers, excluding non-melanoma skin cancers, which you heard are the most common ones. 13% of our patients have more than one cancer. Breast and prostate cancers are the most common, followed by lung and thyroid. We have some rare cancers, including three peritoneal mesotheliomas, one lung mesothelioma, and some male breast cancer cases. And if you look, not unexpectedly, there are differences in cancer distribution between men and women, with breast cancer most common in women and prostate cancer most common in men. But in women, lung cancer is our second most common cancer, and in men, it's lymphoma. So there is some differences in the distribution of these cancers. Do the ca so we can't really look at the epidemiology, but we thought it's very important to begin to understand, are there differences in how, I'm going to be a minute over, are there differences in how these cancers behave? Because this is really the importance of, of understanding this. And so we looked at our 601 patients with primary breast cancer, uh, including the nine men. Of these, 17% of the women had more than one primary cancer, so a fairly high number with more than one cancer. If we compare this to SEER data, there was a higher proportion of poorly differentiated grade three tumors among the World Trade Center exposed women with breast cancer. And if we looked at the characteristics of the cancer, there's a higher proportion of triple negative molecular subtypes. So this is a certain type of cancer. So this is early data. This is preliminary data, but begins to suggest that we really do need to look uh, more de detailed into these cancers so that we can understand how they're behaving and how they're developing. We also begin to look, are beginning to look at those in our younger population. To date, we have 118 cancer patients. These include thyroid, breast, lymphoma, head and neck sites, leukemia, colon and rectum, and multiple myeloma. Again, all of these need to look, be looked at in more detail. So what do we need to know? We need to understand cancer characteristics among World Trade Center survivors. Do they differ from the general population in women, men, and those who are younger? Is there an excess of certain types of cancer in those exposed at a young age? Do mental and physical comorbidities, as you just heard from Dr. Crane, modify cancer outcomes? And what are those cancer outcomes, including survival among World Trade Center survivors? Is World Trade Center exposure associated with specific carcinogenic mechanisms in select cancers in the initiation or the progression? Are there common mechanisms across these cancers, for example, in tumor suppressor genes? Are World Trade Center exposures associated with specific carcinogenic mechanisms associated with earlier age and exposure? Why do we need to answer these questions? Clearly, so that we can understand what to do for future environmental disasters, what is the role of environmental exposures in cancer initiation and progression? Clearly, so that we can improve our screening for cancers and we can detect cancers er earlier and also for treatment so that we can understand in this age of personalized medication, what are the pathways involved in these cancers? And we need broad populations to answer these questions. We need those with acute and chronic exposures. We need women and men, and we need diverse race, ethnicity, and the young and the old. And so I went over. I'm going to thank you very much for this. And I have one last thing to say. I want to quote Dr. Crane, get vaccinated, get vaccinated, get vaccinated. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Dr. Rodman. And you, see, you can see from hers and other presentations why the research program supported by NIOSH is so important so that we continue to learn as we move along in time. Our next speaker is Dr. Jacqueline Moline. Uh, she's Vice President and Chair of Department of Occupational Medicine, Epidemiology and Prevention at Hostra Northwell School of Medicine and Medical Director 
or perhaps director actually of the World Trade Center Clinical Center of Excellence at Norwell, uh, Northwell. So welcome, Dr. Moline. Thank you, Stephen. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And, and I just, uh, being back at Mount Sinai, where I uh, was in 2001, when this all started, um, I'd just like to acknowledge two people who aren't here today who were instrumental in the programs, and that's Dr. Stephen Levin and Dr. Robin Herbert, who without their leadership, um, these programs would not exist, and we probably would not be in this room talking about the World Trade Center health programs. So um, just uh, like to, to give a shout out to them. Um, one of the things that has always confronted us, and um, I'll never forget, I think it was uh, around October 17th or so, 2001, and Dr. Reidman and I, uh, along with, so I, I forget who else, there was, some, there was another doctor who was actually, it was Dr. Levin. We were in a community um, meeting in uh, uh, downtown, and we were asked, um, what about cancers? And we had no answers then, but we did know that we would not see, or we could not conclusively say that we would see cancers right away. Um, people were adamant that they were going to happen, and it turns out that they were absolutely right. Um, because the complex mixture of dust, so over 150 compounds, has done something to uh, increase rates of cancers and cause other disease processes. What I wanted to address briefly today, and, and I really don't have a lot of the biological answers for this, but I just wanted to give a little uh, discussion of why does it take so long for diseases to happen? But more importantly, what are we looking at in the program in terms of diseases and for example, cancers were certified in 2012, where we certified rhinosinusitis right away in the program. Um, and that's because we needed the research and we needed time for um, the science to develop so that we could have a conclusive understanding if cancer rates were increased. So there is what we call a temporal sequence, meaning a time, <clears throat> time sequence for when a disease is started and when there's a latency. Now, we're all very familiar with an induction or an incubation period. In an incubation period, we're all too familiar with, with COVID. We know it's on the course of about two to, to 14 or two to 12 days. But when we're thinking of cancers or other diseases of long latency, this can be on the order of decades. So there's a period of, first you have an induction period where whatever changes that are gonna lead to the disease process begin to occur, whether it's cancer, whether it's changes in the lung, whether it's scarring in the lung or COPD, whether it's changes in the brain, as we've heard about the cognitive changes that we are seeing in the World Trade Center survivors. So there's a change from the induction period and then there's a the latency period. And this is where the latency period becomes something that can be very short, depending on the disease, meaning if you are exposed to that toxic dust, you could have an immediate response to your upper airway, your lower airway, from, or your gastrointestinal tract, where you had the burning, you had the nasal um, and respiratory problems, and then the, the GERD. Um, but for cancers and certain cancers, and, and um, it can take decades. And I just wanted to go through some of the latency periods that we um, are on the lookout for and have been authorized as part of the World Trade Center program. Dr. Byman mentioned four mesotheliomas. Mesothelioma is a signature cancer for asbestos. And if we look at the dust samples, it ranges from about one to 4% of the settled dust that was collected by Paul Leoy and others at Rutgers in the days following 9-11 had asbestos in it and 
a mesothelioma is a classic disease of long latency. In this case, the minimum latency required is 11 years, according to the World Trade Center program, based on multiple studies. Now, that doesn't mean that all cancers will occur within 11 years, but more commonly they're seeing 30, 40, 50, or 60, or even 70 years. So luckily, this program will be around, and hopefully no one else will get mesothelioma. But if that classic disease of long latency appears, then they will be covered under the program. All other solid cancers, and we heard from Dr. Reidman about some of the cancers that are being seen in the survivor clinic, and that's no different than what's been seen in the responder clinic with breast cancer and uh, prostate cancer and lung cancer. So those are all about, uh, they have a latency period of four years. The blood cancers have a much shorter latency period of less than a year. Thyroid cancer is also somewhat shorter based on studies of folks exposed to radiation. And for childhood cancers, they are all much shorter. There are also diseases <clears throat> that are non-cancerous that have a long latency period, and that can be scarring of the lungs or pulmonary fibrosis, things that we have to worry about. We know that pesticide-related or dioxin-related, Agent Orange-related skin, thyroid, and cancer-related conditions can occur 10 to 20 years later. We also know that kidney disease can manifest 10 to 20 years later if it's caused by metals. And we also know that neurodegenerative diseases can begin to occur at around 10 to 20 years, which is in the time period that we are in now and may be related to why we're beginning to see some of these findings from um, that have been outlined by Dr. Luft earlier today. So that's just to say we need to be careful. We need to be vigilant. We need to look for diseases that might be occurring at an earlier stage, but also continue to follow people forward to see what happens in the future. And one of the slides <clears throat> Dr. Crane showed us very early on, it showed that 0%, 40% of people had zero um, conditions that were certified. So that means that 40% of people have no World Trade Center health effects that have been seen in our program yet, in the responder program. Let's hope that 40% stays there, but we have to be vigilant to make sure that for those 40% they continue to come back so that if you do have a health problem, we know if you are in the treatment programs, then your survival will be you have a better rate of survival than if you're not in the program because of the care you'll receive with no out-of-pocket expense. So again, I'd like to thank you for, um, for being here, for everything that any of the responders have done, for teaching us so much, and for giving us hope in the midst of such a terrible disaster. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Denise Harrison, who's an assistant professor of medicine, environmental medicine at NYU Grossman School of Medicine, and also the medical director of the World Trade Center uh, Cl Clinical Center of Excellence uh, at NYU. So, Dr. Harrison, welcome. Yes. Good morning, everyone. So, I'm going to be talking about. Um, re-traumatization re and its effect on 9-11 responders, specifically focusing on the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. So as you all know, there has been a lot of tragedies that has occurred since 9-11, including multiple hurricanes, Katrina, Sandy, and more recently, Hurricane Ida, not only in New Orleans, but also its effects here in the Northeast. Also, what's going on in Afghanistan um, is another, uh, potential re episode. There's also other smaller um, terror attacks involving vehicular killings, mass shootings, and bombings. So what, what has been the health effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on 9-11 responders? To date, there are no systemic large-scale studies published with 9-11 exposed population. However, this is expected to change as information is being gathered. So what can we expect? We can extrapolate from studies that have been done on other populations. 
There has been several meta-analysis analysis report that reports increased symptoms of anxiety and depression in COVID frontline workers. This is both when compared to the pre-COVID scores and also compared to non-frontline workers. In addition, there's other studies that show that previously traumatized populations are frequently more vulnerable than those without prior trauma, with increased rates of mental health diagnosis, including PTSD following subsequent exposure. The theoretical mechanism besides this includes an increased likelihood of reactivation of prior trauma, particularly if the current trauma has similar resemblance to the previous trauma. So what are some of the ways that this COVID-19 pandemic um, resembles the 9-11 tragedy? Some of the concrete reminders increase, includes mass deaths, presence of temporary morgues in the city, the streets were vacated and the city was quiet again, and there was also the presence of the USS Comfort Ship docked in New York City for the first time since 9-11. And other uh, uh, thematically similar threats are what we call invisible threats, whether this be virus or a terrorist, it has the potential to cause eminent threat to life and public safety. This leads to the sense of vulnerability and increased powerlessness due to lack of control, safety, and predictability, which in turn leads to increased anxiety, nightmares, flashbacks, sleep impairment. Fortunately, um, there, there appears to be a waxing and then a waning course. Studies of uh, recent meta-analysis have shown that multiple populations may be more resilient than previously thought, with symptoms increasing towards the beginning of 2020 and then declining towards the end. Similar authors also describe one study of adults, both frontline workers and non-frontline front workers in Spain, we showed an initial increase in symptoms, followed by a subsequent decrease in anxiety as COVID-related fatality dropped. The full scope of the mental health effects of frontline workers, including 9-11 exposed in individuals, remains to be seen. So, we know, so what are some of the ways that the program has helped during this pandemic? We know historically that it's, it's often more difficult to find a mental health provider when compared to finding general medical care with difficulty of up to 34% for mental health providers and up to 13% for routine medical care. When looked at, there's also evidence that there's the out-of-pocket expenses when you use out-of-network providers is also more for, um, for, the, for, for uh, people getting mental health services compared to general medical care. So how has the World Trade Center helped? All of the CCEs performed what we call wellness checks that uh, we made every effort. Of course, we had to prioritize those who were deemed to be more at risk, um, uh, more at risk for being affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. But we made effort to try to contact all our patients, even if it's just a phone call saying we're here for you. Um, because we know of the pervasive effect of the, the COVID-19 pandemic and that it could affect people who uh, often did not have any symptoms prior to the pandemic. Having a program that is familiar with their medical care and mental history allows the responder to receive care more promptly at a lesser expense and without having to go through the emotional draining process of having to tell their story again. CCE therapists are often the closest approximation to being there since they hear thousands of narrative. This helps to establish safety and trust. First responders are necessary personnel. Police officers carry weapons, healthcare workers have to provide care. So ready access to trauma focused therapy is essential. So I'd just like to end by saying that this demonstrates the continued need to provide mental health services, um, and also the need to provide research, not only in mental disorders, but, only, uh, but also in brain health um, as affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you.
Thank you, Denise. Um, our next speaker is a program participant from the Responder Program. It's Carol Robles Roman. And uh, Ms. Robles Roman um, is actually general counsel and dean of faculty at H Hunter College. Uh, and we'll spend a few minutes telling about her experiences in relation to the program, in relation to her own illness, and, and uh, resulting from World Trade Center exposures. Good morning. This is um, a bit of a big deal for me to present today. Like many survivors and responders, the events of 20 years ago is still a tremendous source of trauma and, um, and PTSD for me. I'm here as a, as a general responder member of the World Trade Center Health Program, and I think it's so important for us to tell our stories because we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to this program, and that certainly is my story. I was exposed to dangerous World Trade Center uh, environmental toxins when I worked downtown as special counsel to then Chief Judge Judith Kay and the Chief Administrative Judge Jonathan Littman. Because immediately following the terrorist attacks, the state courts received the shocking news that 20 of our court officers from lower Manhattan ran into the face of danger uh, and they went into the World Trade Center buildings to rescue victims of the attack. And three of our court officers were missing. And I'd like to say their names today in their memory. Captain Harry Thompson, Court Officer Tommy Jurgens, and Court Officer Mitch Wallace. So soon thereafter, um, I was tasked to represent the state courts to go down to ground zero in the immediate aftermath in the days that follow to help oversee the rescue and the recovery efforts by our court officer responders at ground zero with state and city officials and to search. We held up hope that we were gonna find our three missing court officer responders. There were no masks, there was no PPE, there was nothing. In January, I was appointed New York City Deputy Mayor for Legal Affairs and counsel to Michael Bloomberg and the recovery and cleanup effort at Ground Zero was a critical priority of the new administration. And as Deputy Mayor, I worked closely with city agencies involved in the recovery and cleanup efforts um, and continued to visit the zone. And my offices were in Lower Manhattan. This work was very traumatic. And over the years, I buried it. I went on to have my wonderful, illustrious legal career. Well, in 2017, I was diagnosed with stage three lung cancer. I realize now that after I watched this wonderful presentations, I had all the symptoms. I had the World Trade Center cough and almost every other list on the diagnoses. I was in shock. I was devastated. I was in despair. I mean, come on, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I've been vegetarian for most of my adult life, not all of it. How the hell did this happen? Friends reached out and they tried to connect the 9-11 dots for me and, and I wouldn't listen. I was on automatic pilot. I was preparing for a lobectomy. You gotta take out what? Half my lung? Yep, that's the way it's gonna go. Then you're gonna have chemo, then you're gonna have radiation, the works. I started immunotherapy that didn't work. Instead, I got pneumonia. The stats from my diagnosis was staggering, was devastating. P.S. Don't Google it, it's not a fun read. I was kind of resigned to my fate. Well, even though I didn't listen or connect the 9-11 dots, thank God that my husband did. He arranged for, he should be here because he says I never say anything nice about him. <laughs> <laughs> He arranged for an interview with a, with a wonderful attorney that he trusted, as well as a gifted outreach coordinator with the Mount Sinai World, uh, Mount Sinai World Trade Center program, Jeannie Kelly. And I have to say, it's highly unlikely I would have become part of the program without this kind, gentle, but very firm outreach and intervention. I admit I was a tough nut to crack. I didn't get it. I have insurance. 
The damage is done. What is the benefit to me now? Let me do what I need to do. Well, two critical things were explained to me. Number one, the comprehensive annual physical, the program, and the monitoring that members get. Oh my God, that makes so much sense. Number two, there may come a time, Carol, I was told, that a new drug may come on the scene. And in those cases, insurance will not cover it. But it is likely that the 9-11 health program will. Soon thereafter, I was certified by the 9-11 health program as a general responder. And I am eternally grateful that I was. You see, in 2018, a new lung cancer drug was on the scene. And I had the unique genetic profile to get it. And I had done all the research on my own. It wasn't something that my doctors had recommended it to me. I saw it and I found it. I was following it. They call me Dr. Roman now at home, but that's <laughs> another story. But my oncologist at Sloan told me it would be impossible for me to get the drug approved from my stage. Too new. Insurance is not going to cover it, Carol. Wait a minute. Isn't this the exact scenario that I had been told as an incentive to be part of the World Trade Center Health Program? I reminded my doctor that I was part of the 9-11 Health Program. She lit up and she looked at me and said, Carol, you're in the game. Well, this miracle drug for lung cancer patients with EGFR genetic profile is called Tegriso, and I continue to take it. I was soon declared NED, no evidence of disease. Clinical trials for Tegriso that followed were remarkable. My doctor later congratulated me the next year for being so pushy. That's a talk for another day. Unfortunately, in late 2019, the cancer metastasized to my bones. I now have lesions in my spine, my hip, my scapula, and I will not lie, psychologically, I tanked. The social workers at Mount Sinai were so helpful to me at this time. The caseworker who has helped manage my care throughout has been excellent. They put me in touch with integrative approaches as well, like acupuncture, which I do now um, twice a week with a World Trade Center approved doctor. It has been phenomenal in relieving pain and fatigue. I close by saying the lung cancer bone progression in my body has been slow, inexplicably slow. I continue with radiation, chemo, and other treatments. What can I say? Thank you, Tegrissa. Thank you, World Train Center Health Program. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God. I am so grateful for this chance to praise your miracle that I am here today and can hopefully help others because they are still many responders and survivors that are not part of this critical program. I have personally educated off the top of my head at least 20 to 30 people. I meet them at the grocery store. I meet them at church and we start chatting. Teachers, reporters, a chiropractor who had volunteered, a college professor from Pace University, judges, lawyers, even my church deacon. I had gone to seek spiritual counseling when I had gotten sick the second time. And the deacon is not saying anything spiritual. He's just kind of staring at me, stunned. And it turned out, which I didn't know, that the deacon had been a journalist in a former life. And he had been right at 9-11. He had been right in the street. He practically saw the two planes hit and the rest was history for him. I ended up counseling him right there in the church basement. And you will be happy to know that he has since applied to the health program and has been certified. God works in mysterious ways for sure. Thank you all for the opportunity to share my story with you and to share this incredible panel today. Thank you.
And thank you so much, Carol, for um, talking with us today. You know, uh, being up here and listening to the speakers, the doctors, I have to say that um, some of the message here is, is a little depressing, that, that perhaps things will happen in the future by way of various uh, diseases that may develop that people may be at risk for in the future, and that uh, there is uh, you know, not all that much hope. And I have to say that the two program participants who uh, spoke today have really told us why this program is so important to them, uh, why we need this program, and why we should have hope for the future. So I would like to thank them in particular. Our next speaker is Dr. Jeffrey Lowe. Uh, he's clinical co-director of the FDNY World Trade Center Health Program. And he's also Deputy Chief Medical Officer at FDNY. And I might add, as a person who uh, works at Queens College, that he is also a native of Queens. Dr. Lowe. Thank you. <coughs> Take a look over here. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, thank you for having us. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mount Sinai, the Icon School of Medicine, 9-11 Health Watch, CDC NIOSH, uh, FDNY leadership, uh, our union delegates, uh, fellow clinical centers. Um, what a fantastic community uh, that we have in uh, doing such great work. And um, I'd also like to thank our FDNY members and uh, staff committed to caring for our members. Uh, so. It's 20 years after 9-11, and our members continue to suffer from significant physical and mental health impacts uh, due to their uh, exposures. Um, much of the following information has been published in our 20th year summary that's available on the uh, nyc.gov uh, website. Uh, so let's get right into it. I'm sorry, is that, oh my. Okay, um, so I'll start off with some basic information about our program. We have over 15,000 enrolled firefighters and EMS uh, providers uh, since 9-11. 86% um, of them are firefighters and 14% are EMTs, paramedics, and fire inspectors. Um, this graph shows the initial arrival time at ground zero with 14% uh, of our members uh, arriving the morning of 9-11, 44% arriving the afternoon of 9-11, and many of our active and retired members uh, arriving in the following days as well as months. Um, on 9-11, we lost 343 of our members, uh, firefighters and EMS providers. And uh, since then, we've lost over 250 members from World Trade Center related illnesses. Um, in addition to that, we are, we are dealing with thousands of members that are suffering to this day. Um, we take care of them every day. So uh, within a few months after 9-11, FDNY began comparing our members' health indicators and noted significant changes. Um, physical and mental health surveys were also administered uh, during annual exams. So uh, to meet the growing needs of our members, we developed four units, uh, medical monitoring, where we perform annual WTC screening and treatment of physical health issues. Um, we have offices at FDNY headquarters, Staten Island, Fort Totten, Orange County, and Suffolk County. Um, uh, I need to mention, uh, and, uh, and I think that this is important, our leadership, uh, that includes Dr. Prezant, Dr. Kerry Kelly, Dr. Viola Ortiz, had the foresight to move uh, satellites out to uh, where our members uh, gravitate towards, active and retired. Um, and that's, that's why we have our satellites in those locations. Uh, we have a cancer care unit uh, for ca uh, cancer case management. 
a counseling services uh, unit that uh, monitors and treats the mental health impacts of 9-11. Uh, our um, counseling services uh, units are located either in adjacent offices to medical monitoring or close to each medical monitoring unit. Um, our data center um, analyzes health data, performs research, and generates reports to CDC NIOSH. Um, data analysis helps drive the direction of member care and policy. Um, I call this one the take-home slide. I, I, whenever I review it, um, I oftentimes feel like I need to double check this because uh, the numbers can feel overwhelming. Um, as our program continued its monitoring and treatment, we have found that nearly 75% of our members have at least one World Trade Center certified condition, with many members having more. Um, more than 3,000 members have at least one cancer uh, certification and over 4,300 members have at least one mental health certification. Oftentimes, members have multiple certifications, as been, has been mentioned before. Um, this graphic um, and the data it represents was really one of the first warning indications, uh, uh, indicators um, of the need for a World Trade Center uh, health program. It shows a pulmonary function over time in FDNY firefighters and uh, EMS providers. And um, um, even 20 years later, we have a, a decline uh, in, in lung function, a significant one. Um, it's most significant in current smokers and our tobacco cessation program has decreased uh, smokers to 4% of our cohort. Um, this graphic shows uh, the most common certified physical health conditions, and um, uh, we see it affecting over 40% of our WTC-exposed firefighters and over 19% of our WTC-exposed EMS providers. Um, this is a response gradient uh, for uh, the most common conditions, showing that um, uh, members that arrived uh, earliest at ground zero uh, wound up wound up developing these diagnoses a lot uh, a lot more frequently. Uh, sleep apnea continues to be a, a significant uh, um, medical illness uh, in our program. We have currently over three thousand enrolled responders that have a certification for sleep apnea, and eighty three percent have been treated in the last five years. Um, we've seen significant increases in uh, cancer uh, compared to the general population, in particular prostate, thyroid, uh, hematologic malignancies, and uh, skin cancer. And um, I mentioned earlier that we have uh, over 4,300 members with uh, mental health uh, certifications. Uh, this is a, um, a breakdown of uh, their diagnoses with PTSD, depression being predominant, and adjustment disorder, anxiety disorder at significant rates as well. Um, and here we are 20 years later and uh, we have significant rates of PTSD as well as depression, um, particularly in members, in, uh, in members that uh, arrived earliest at ground zero. So uh, these conditions and rates are significant even 20 years later and we can't forget are lost um, and uh, those that are suffering uh, daily that we take care of. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. <coughs> Our next speaker is Dr. David Prezant. He's a professor of medicine at Albert Einstein College of Medicine 
and in his spare time, he's also chief medical officer of the fire department of New York. He's special advisor to the fire commissioner of FDNY, and he's also director of the FDNY World Trade Center Health Program. Welcome, David. Well, again, thank everyone for the invite here today to talk about these important topics. Uh, you know, there, there is, uh, in one way, a, a depressing note, as Stephen mentioned, that we still have so many people who are afflicted <clears throat> with all of these physical and mental health maladies. And I've been asked to talk about later emerging diseases, which also can add uh, a somber tone to our discussions today. And I look at it as, yes, it's, it's, it's somber, but we should be grateful that there's been total, complete transparency in this program from day one. That there isn't a single exposed person out there who can say no program exists, who can say this has been covered up. Because in so many environmental and occupational disasters in the history of this world, that can't be said. And 20 years later, we, all of us here, and all of the people that we serve, and all of our staff members are still here. And to me, that is really the most important part of this story, that with the federal funding, with philanthropic funding, but also with a tremendous amount of energy and dedication from our patients, our members, our staffs, all of us, these programs still exist. And as you notice from a lot of the slides, while the conditions still exist, there have been treatment responses. People are coping a little bit better or a lot better. And as we heard from just a marvelous presentation from one of our responders now suffering from cancer, her lifespan has been significantly lengthened by treatment that's only available uh, in this program. And we've just uh, recently published, I did not know that you were going to speak on this, so I would have had a slide, but we recently published, uh, not only in our 20-year report, but in a scientific journal, that the FDNY group and the general responder group uh, with Mount Sinai as its data center, uh, cancer patients in those two groups have a significantly higher survival rate than cancer patients without exposure, without World Trade Center exposure in New York State. That is a tremendous message. Uh, it's multifactorial, I'm certain. It has to do with early monitoring, early diagnosis, early treatment, healthy worker effect. There, there are many reasons for it that we have to explore further. But the fact that being a participant in the FDNY or the general responder clinical centers translates into improved survivability for our cancer patients, we can never, ever forget that, and we should be extremely proud of it. At the same time, we also have to recognize that there are late emerging diseases that do not have these benefits. And we need to continue, as the Droga Act requires us to, to continue to explore these issues to determine whether they are worthy, statistically significant, for being included in the World Trade Center monitoring program. We heard a little bit about the cognitive issues from Dr. Luft a few moments ago, and I'll get to that uh, momentarily myself. First and foremost uh, is pulmonary fibrosis, because it is expected that 10, 20, 30 years later, we would see pulmonary fibrosis if we are modeling our program uh, after asbestos exposures. And luckily, pulmonary fibrosis has not been epidemic. There have been small but increasing numbers. 
and luckily pulmonary fibrosis is covered by the program. There are two drugs out there that are equally expensive as cancer chemotherapy uh, that are available through the program and lung transplantation is also available through the program, though we hopefully uh, will keep those numbers very small. So unlike the other late emerging diseases that I will now talk about, pulmonary fibrosis is covered by the program. We have uh, an increasing number of autoimmune diseases, only one of which is covered by the program, and that is sarcoidosis. And here you can see uh, in the fire department cohort uh, age-specific incidence rates per 100,000 FDNY males uh, between the years 2002 and 2015. Uh, and this was compared to a, a group of similarly matched uh, males, uh, age matched, uh, living in Rochester, uh, who uh, are not firefighters and are not World Trade Center exposed. And the incidence rate in our World Trade Center exposed firefighters and EMS members was two and a half times higher than that seen in the Rochester Epidemiology Project. And this has been confirmed uh, in both the Mount Sinai General Responder uh, Data Center uh, as well as the World Trade Center Health Registry. Equally, if not even more important, is, is that World Trade Center sarcoidosis in the fire department is different from pre-9-11 sarcoidosis in the fire department. We had also published pre-9-11 that sarcoidosis was increased in firefighters. But at that time and since then, we followed those patients. It primarily is a lung problem, and it resolves in about 40% of those patients. Very few have needed treatment, only about 5% of the pre-9-11 sarcoid patients. But here you can see a dramatic difference in the post-9-11, the World Trade Center exposed sarcoidosis patients at FDNY. We followed them for an average of eight years, many for 10 to 12 years. And we saw, as we would expect, about 40% had resolution of their intrathoracic, their pulmonary and intrathoracic lymph node enlargement. They were all first diagnosed, all of them, with pulmonary sarcoid. But what we saw and what we did not expect to see was an increasing number of patients who, although their pulmonary sarcoid was stable or resolved, they developed over time sarcoidosis in their joints or in their heart. And these two conditions have required an immense amount of treatment to allow these patients to live a normal life. The joint sarcoidosis is even different than what the textbooks have said about joint sarcoid. Textbooks say that it's easily treated with a very inexpensive drug. We have found that that's not the case, that most of these patients have needed uh, TNF blocking agents, or what is often referred to as biologics, which is uh, you see advertised on TV for other autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, Phil Mickelson has an ad uh, where he's the spokesperson for Embro. Uh, Venus Williams has an ad. I think she's the spokesperson for a different one. Uh, the reason why is they're the only people in the world that can afford these drugs, all right? Uh, unless you're a member of the World Trade Center Health Program. Uh, where these drugs, which cost on average about $5,000 a month, uh, are provided by the program. We have many, many members now uh, who uh, have joint sarcoid, as you can see from this slide, that have required either uh, one of these biologic drugs with really great improvement. The cardiac patients have actually life-threatening sarcoid. And just a few months ago, uh, we had one of these patients die from cardiac sarcoid while awaiting a lung transplant. I'm sorry, a heart transplant. Uh, but thankfully, the remaining cardiac sarcoid patients that we have have all been stable, but they have also required often biologic agents, uh, auto defibrillators, 
uh, to protect them from ventricular uh, arrhythmias and sudden death. We've made a substantial, a substantial impact on these people. Without our early diagnosis and intervention, uh, these patients would have a very poor quality of life and some uh, may have died from their cardiac sarcoid. There are other autoimmune diseases that are increased uh, and this is a very hard thing for us to, to publish on and study and convince NIOSH of because unlike cancer, there are not autoimmune registries throughout the country. So with cancer, all of the investigators up here were able to compare to uh, tumor registries throughout the country. There are no such registries for autoimmune diseases. So again, we've had to look hard for reference groups. But what you can see here is that systemic lupus, which you should not see in a male predominantly white population, is dramatically increased uh, in our World Trade Center fire and EMS workers. You can also see that there are uh, other autoimmune diseases that are just missing statistical significance. But when you add them all up together, uh, there is an excess number of cases in the World Trade Center exposed group. It's 34% higher, and it just misses statistical significance. But if you look at it as a trend effect, there's definitely statistical significance. Cardiovascular diseases, we, the World Trade Center Health Registry, uh, the GRC here, have published uh, increased rates. Uh, and we have shown an exposure response gradient for this, with the, once again the highest rates of cardiovascular disease in those that responded earliest at ground zero. Uh, neurologic conditions. Uh, here we are just beginning to look at this. We don't have yet evidence for uh, any increases at this time, but these are notable diseases. These are very rare diseases. Uh, our cognition issues have been small uh, in terms of their severity uh, and have been primarily in those with current PTSD. What we have noticed is a dramatic issue in terms of hearing, uh, and we've published that. That's been confirmed by audiometry, and actually, uh, along with the World Trade Center Health Registry, which partnered with us on this, uh, NIOSH awarded us a prize for this particular uh, publication. So with that, I'd like to thank you all. I'd like to leave on a note of real accomplishment by all of us and by all of you, a note of hope that although these diseases still exist, although emerging conditions are still occurring, we are making a real difference in the lives of our patients. And by sharing this journey with you, our patients are making a real difference in our lives. Thank you very much. Uh, th <clears throat> thank you, David. You know, David and, and a previous speaker, Carol, emphasized the advantage of the World Trade Center Health Program in terms of improved treatment and really making a crucial difference in people's lives. But the monitoring program also allows for early identification of disease, including many cancers, a lung disease, and the like. And early identification, early detection of disease should lead to better outcomes as well. So it's an enormous advantage of the health program that it does that. Our next speaker is um, Dr. Iris Yudison. Iris is a professor of environmental and occupational medicine at the Rutgers University School of Public Health. And she's also a medical director of the World Trade Center, Clinical Center of Excellence at Rutgers. So welcome, Iris. So this point's here, this point's there. Okay, so um, I also want to be uplifting in my remarks, and I want to talk about how we get a new condition added into the program, uh, the new condition that we would like to hopefully add into the program is, is uterine cancer, and, um, and I'm going to discuss its relationship with endocrine disruptors. And I also want to say, I want to do a shout out to somebody who's not with us, but certainly contributed to everything we're doing in the program. And that's Dr. Paul Leoy, who led the exposure assessment team and made a significant number of dust measurements. And I wish he was here to, um, to 
see what we've done after 20 years. Okay, so um, we've all seen this slide about the top 10 certified cancers and how common the cancers are. And we heard the uplifting things and the way we've had really good access to treatment for the other cancers. And I have patients with uterine cancer that need the expensive Venus Williams drugs, that need the cancer case management, that need the mental health care um, that goes with it um, due to their cancers. And so this is why I would like to um, get us thinking about uterine cancer and the importance of certifying the uterine cancer. So what exactly is an endocrine disruptor and what was there at World Trade that is an endocrine disruptor? So many of the exposure assessment scientists studied what was there. As I said, Dr. Leoy is one of the people who studied this and endocrine disruption is known to be carcinogenic in humans, and I'll be talking a little bit about the mechanisms of that. So what was there that was an endocrine disruptor? Well, jet fuel, for goodness sakes, is all filled with all kinds of toxic organic things, and the plume of black smoke, it contained volatile organics, it contained metals including cadmium, it contained polyaromatic hydrocarbons. The collapse of the towers not only contained the highly alkaline material that we always talk about, it contained uh, PCBs, furans, dioxin, all kinds of toxic things. And then, how do we know that people actually absorb these things and maybe they just disappeared? But they didn't disappear. All this stuff was found in people's apartments, it was found in the ground, it was found on trees, and all kinds of levels of polychlorinated compounds, dibenzofurans were found. And most recently, most recently, there were studies that found some of these materials actually in mothers that were pregnant during the 9-11 um, disaster, and, um, and this, these materials were found in cord blood. So what exactly is an endocrine disruptor? An endocrine disruptor is something that interferes with hormone synthesis, metabolism, actions, and can produce adverse reproductive effects, neurologic effects, immune effects, cancer in humans and in animals. Endocrine disruptors interfere with all kinds of cancer pathways, including estrogens, androgens, steroids, all kinds of good things. Prenatal exposure, important in the survivor population, certainly um, has been shown to um, uh, cause increase in breast and vaginal tumors, as well as uterine cancer in animals. Known endocrine disruptors historically not part of the World Trade Program, historically include diethylstilbestrol, DES, and bisphenol A, BPA, found in plastics. So, we all know about DES. In fact, this is the 50th anniversary of DES, which was unfortunately used to improve pregnancy outcomes, and what happened? What happened to the daughters of women who took DES is they developed a pathognomonic cancer, a clear cell vaginal cancer. So clearly the idea of endocrine disrupting chemicals causing cancer is an important one. Further studies about developmental effects in addition to cancer-causing effects have been shown in numerous studies. Um, TC TCDDs and related compounds modulate many hormone systems. Phetotoxicity, thymus, structural malformation, uh, neurotransmission, thyroid, even thyroid cancer could be related to this. So, 
Mo most recently, most recently, a very large Medline review was um, published in 2019, and there are now human studies that are confirming some of the carcinogenic effects of endocrine disruptors, um, showing this to be a plausible mechanism for causing this type, these types of cancers. And I want to leave you with my last couple of slides about cancer and endocrine disruptors, noting all the other cancers that are covered by the Zadroga Act, including prostate, breast, ovarian, testicular, vaginal, penile cancer. But note the last one in bold that's not covered by the Zadroga program. So where does this leave us? This leaves us at the 20th anniversary. We want to honor and remember those people that have done so much for us at the 9-11 exposure. We want to improve the quality of life for everyone. We're grateful to NIOSH that they're going to be reviewing our petition and the careful search of the literature to um, hopefully demonstrate to the stack committee that there is indeed plausibility to consider uterine cancer as a 9-11 um, related cancer and that's going to be happening September 27th and 28th. And finally, I want to thank everyone who made it possible for me to be here, most of all my patients. Um, and I love all my patients, those people who come to New Jersey, know the good care that we give you in New Jersey. It's not just a New York program. Um, I, want to thank, I want to thank my fellow faculty. I have a wonderful nursing and mental health staff um, that don't get recognized enough. Certainly my funding agency, CDC NIOSH, and my family for allowing me to do this because my family often feels deprived because I'm doing 9-11 related activities. So thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Iris. And uh, it's not just a New York program. It's not even just a New York and New Jersey program. It's a national program, <coughs> which is why we have our next speaker, John Cochran, <coughs> physician, a long career after a long career as part of the Mayo Clinic Health System, joined Logistics Health, Inc., and he's medical director of the World Trade Center National Provider Network. So welcome, John. Thank you, Dr. Markowitz. Um, I feel privileged to be part of this uh, distinguished panel. Um, I want to express my appreciation to Holly Nicolati, who helped uh, bring this together, uh, the presentation. Um, we are kind of an outlier, uh, being outside uh, the New York area, and wanted to just briefly go over the National Provider Network. And this isn't a weather map of uh, rain, but uh, <laughs> is, is showing, um, you know, where our members are at. And 54% uh, are um, in, considered to be in rural areas. This is out of a total of 17,000 members, and about two thirds of those would be responders. And if you look at the map, um, you could see outside of New York, uh, really, it turns out Florida is our kind of our biggest group, even more than New Yorkers. And then after that, it's mostly uh, East Coast groups. Um, let's go on. If we look at this uh, next map, it's just that where are the providers? We've added. Um, We've gone from like 5,000 treatment providers to 17,000 treatment providers in the last 10 years. And we have 1,000 providers providing uh, monitoring exams. So um, because of that, we have 90% are within uh, 30 miles. So it, it just kind of does speak to the, when you're dealing with some 18,000 providers, it's a fairly complex uh, group. Um, 
because of this, this is kind of my complexity slide saying where we need a bit where you can access care individually through lhi.care. Certainly we have a, a nice, great team of case managers. The network is always in flux and you can see it's kind of quadrupled over the last uh, 10 years. There's certainly a continued effort on quality improvement and training of our monitoring providers. Um, I think the, the main thing is that uh, it's a complexity that we don't always uh, meet successfully, but we're committed to improving it. It turns out that we have both my boss and my boss's boss were um, responders at the Pentagon. Uh, they were involved in triage of care there. And uh, so just wanted to speak to the effort that um, we want to see, you know, great service and great quality and are committed to keep doing that. So any further questions, I'd be happy to take them later. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, we have a few minutes, uh, actually, time for questions. And I want to start uh, with a question that came in. Um, I think actually for you, John, it, <clears throat> if I'm in the national provider program, how do I find providers? You might want to take it from your seat there. Um, the easiest way is calling our system and then we would uh, be able to uh, connect you with a provider in your area. Hi. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> next um, question related to that, actually. I'm a survivor <clears throat> and a responder. I live in Alabama. <clears throat> Is there a way to connect with other responders for, for support? And not on, not on social media, but for support. So is there a way for national um, participants to, uh, re to connect with other uh, people who are part of the program uh, for social support? I don't know if that's a question for you, John, or uh, for some of the responder programs here in New York, New Jersey. Anybody has any ideas about that? Well, I, I think this is uh, Dave Prezant from FDNY. I, I think social support is, is one of the key features uh, that accounts for our improved survival rates in our cancer patients. A at FDNY, there's multiple ways uh, to have social support. Now, I, I do know we have an advantage because uh, it's a single, em sing single employer uh, that is responsible for our members and uh, they've already developed close ties with each other before the exposure. But they often remark that when they're in the waiting room, uh, that's the first time that they've seen somebody that they work with since 9-11, and that's a bonding or a rebonding experience. There are retiree and uh, active member uh, social groups that get together. And then uh, what I can't say enough about is our family support unit, which uh, takes uh, in, sick FDNY members in the program to their doctor visits, to their hospitals, uh, to their chemotherapy visits. They're driven there. They're driven back. This is a total volunteer effort uh, charged to no one. These are people that volunteer so that no FDNY cancer patient or seriously ill patient has to be concerned about a lonely trip on the subway and then a trip back where they might be vomiting from chemotherapy. Uh, these, are, these are friends, these are bonding experiences. They follow each other for the, forever. And uh, I know that every one of the programs is trying to do the same thing with case management. And that is, I think, the foundation of what makes all of our programs very special. Yeah, Dr. Hudison. One, one of the, um, one of the um, good things that happened to us in New Jersey after COVID 
is my mental health and social work team very aggressively started Zoom groups of people and uh, our cancer survivors who can't get out of their house easily um, now during COVID, but even, even their cancer maybe would keep them out of their houses. But we have various groups that meet online, and perhaps this is something that could be extended to the national program to have um, groups of patients meeting online to talk about what's going on in their lives. And that's one of the things we're very proud of that my um, department has done. Okay, thank you. Our next question is for Dr. Reibman. Um, <clears throat> you showed uh, data on uh, cancers among survivors, and, uh, and there is more limited monitoring or surveillance because it's restricted to people who uh, are survivors who also have a certified condition. But as part of the surveillance that you do, uh, do you uh, engage and offer tests that uh, lead to early detection of some of the cancers that you found? I'm on, oh, I thought I was on. Sorry, thank you. Uh, at the moment, uh, so you're correct in that to get into the program, one uh, has to have a World Trade Center related condition. Those conditions can include the various cancers. Once in the program, we do standard cancer screening, which is which is approved by the uh, World Trade Center Health Program that includes uh, referring for uh, colon cancer screening, cervical cancer screening, uh, breast cancer screening, as well as if indicated lung cancer screening. So at the moment we are doing standard uh, screening uh, that is now suggested by uh, government for cancers. I want to come back to talk about a little bit the group therapy. And I think many of us have found during COVID that there were group um, that we could take our mental health groups and move them as remote groups. And that has proven to be very, very effective for many programs. And I think, again, that's something that we should be thinking about more going forward. So thank you. Uh, here's a question, um, actually, for Dr. Crane, uh, which is, you mentioned uh, the issue of frailty. And, <clears throat> uh, and you're going to do research on frailty. Are you uh, planning on doing, uh, undertaking programs or taking measures uh, for the prevention of frailty among uh, responder population? Can you hear me? Did I push the button? Did I do it? All right. Uh, yes, the answer is yes, all, all of the above. And um, the, um, of course, you have to recruit the population first. Uh, to, to do the study. So we really want to emphasize recruiting that population. Did I say recruiting the population? I, yes. A okay, few times, good. a few times. So we want to do that. Um, and once we do that and learn about, we will learn about the type of uh, interventions that might be most useful and most productive. So um, we are really, really looking forward to this. And also, did I mention recruiting the population? Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question actually for Commander Rizek. To come in, it's for NIOSH. Um, it's a question about the process for, uh, I guess, certification of conditions and how are the standards set for certifying a condition? Yes, um, the program has done extensive research on the data that's come in um, from 9-11-2001 and we continue to look at that research. So certification um, qualifiers are time and the intervals that Dr. Moline talked about. Um, we've made those decisions. They actually haven't changed since the, the beginning of the program, um, but you can find all of those uh, requirements online. Okay, thank you. There's a question um, for whatever doctor wants to take this on. I think um, I have a fatty liver. Uh, should I uh, address it during uh, during my monitoring under the health, uh, WTC health program? I don't know whether Ben, Jackie, or someone else uh, has an idea about uh, monitoring fatty liver part of the program? So there's a, Steve, there's a research yeah. project at Sinai. Go ahead. And, uh, we'd be delighted to uh, talk to you and they would be recruiting you if you're willing to participate in it. It's an excellent group and um, they hope to learn a lot about the conditions. So, yes. Uh, okay, so, but aside from the research, I mean, if, if this person is not in the Sinai program or area, um, 
and it's a question of routine monitoring of fatty liver. How, how should it, is it done? How should it be done? Do I have to worry about it? I think is what they're driving in. No. Go ahead. So, oh, I, I mean, fatty liver is, is monitored by um, special ultrasounds that can uh, assess the degree of fat content and fibrosis or scarring within the liver itself, as well as liver function tests. There are also, it's, it's definitely worth talking to your physician and getting regular monitoring for it. Uh, just anecdotally, I know of a patient who managed to reverse a lot of the fatty liver by some pretty drastic dietary changes. Um, over the course of two or three months where they uh, lost a lot of weight, changed their diet, and actually have had tremendous benefits. So it is possible to, um, through lifestyle changes in, in some cases, um, to modify fatty liver. In other cases, it isn't, but it's something that certainly should be followed on a regular basis by someone who's a specialist in liver diseases. Okay, thank you. Um, so there are a couple questions that have come in. Some specific care questions have come in. And um, if you've provided your name, then we're going to somehow provide some follow-up to that, to those questions. Or, or you could talk to your physician in the program, your provider in the program. Another person has asked whether they can access the videos uh, or the slide presentations. And yes, the videos will be available, um, I think, on the website um, for this program or for the, the health program. And then uh, as far as uh, the slides, uh, uh, we're going to speak with the uh, speakers uh, who made the slides and see if they're willing to make them available. And probably most of them will be made available. So it's noontime, so it's time for us to uh, wrap up this panel. I want to thank uh, the panelists, uh, all the panelists, for uh, really pro providing extremely informative, uh, in, in many ways informative, in very short periods of time, updates about the program, ex your own experiences of the program. And I know looking around that most of you uh, have been involved with this program really for, for the past 20 years. Uh, just an enormous amount of work and dedication on your part uh, to the program, to the people served by the program. I want to thank uh, the audience um, who has listened in to this program. I hope that it's been informative. I hope you learned something. I hope you've uh, learned uh, about what may be coming, but also that you have learned that there is tremendous hope uh, in part because of what this program offers. Offers in terms of improved treatment, offers in terms of early identification, and offers in terms of just the extraordinary dedication of the people that you've heard from today. So with that, I will thank you and remind you that at 2 p.m. actually, there's going to be another program on the Victims' Compensation Fund with some excellent speakers so by all means, uh, tune back in then. Thank you very much.